biology syllabi. As illustrated in her biography, Thetis is involved with many of the clinical centers in Chicago and also in China. Her rich education in clinical work as well as her work in the ministry has given her a solid and ethical background from which she has done superior work as an analyst, supervisor, and teacher. Thetis and I served as co-chairs of the Evaluation of Learning Committee for a number of years. We complemented each other. I think that's a particular form of a twinship. And we did that wonderfully. Thetis was empathic with the candidates and their anxieties about their performance, but also held to the standards espoused by the Institute. As co-chairs, Thetis and I spent many phone calls and lunches uh, trying to find volunteers for various colloquia and volunteers to read papers. But we also had a lot of good times. Thetis is witty and uh, made wonderful comments. We had a lot of laughs together. In short, we worked well together, but we also had a good time. I'm gonna now talk about David. David Garfield is a graduate of the Chicago Psychoanalytic Institute, the University of California Medical School, and did his psychiatry residency at Harvard Medical School. Prior to embarking on his medical career, David was awarded the Newton Prize with highest honors in English literature from Haverford College. He is Professor Emeritus of the Department of Clinical Sciences at the uh, Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science at the Chicago Medical School. He is on the faculty of the Chicago Psychoanalytic Institute and is the author of Unbearable Affect, A Guide to the Psychotherapy of Psychosis and with Steinemann, Self-Psychology and Psychosis. As you can see from his bio, David has many talents. Not many analysts can claim a prize in English literature combined with a residency at Harvard. I certainly don't know anyone like that. Uh, from my friendship and work with David, he is one of the most learned analysts I know. With his soft voice and a thoughtful comment would emerge from David that would feel often to me like wisdom. My experience of getting to know David better was when he and I worked together on the Committee for Evaluation and conducted an oral exam with an advanced candidate. For several years, I had been involved doing these evaluations, but the one with David was special. Instead of the austere climate of the psychoanalytic classrooms, David proposed doing our meeting at his home on a Saturday morning. When I arrived, a full breakfast was on the table. Lox and bagels, scrambled eggs, muffins, fresh orange juice, coffee, it was lavish. So to sum up this gifted man, David is not only a scholar, but also a very generous gentleman. So now Thetis will give her talk. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lucy, for that very generous introduction. And uh, I'm pleased to be able to be here this evening. Uh, with all of you to share some clinical experience uh, with Marion Tolpin. Uh, when Dennis first asked me to talk about my experience being supervised by Marion Tolpin, one vivid memory came to my mind. Marion, standing in the doorway of her corner office, one hand on her hip, the other one waving me to come, her expansive warmth and joyous spirit channeling her eagerness to me about the control case known as Bob that we would work on together. Her office on the 14th floor of 122 South Michigan Avenue had Eastern and Southern exposures. Light filtered through the windows and dappled specks of cream colored warmth upon a healthy and happy ficus tree with dark green leaves. Beside the tree was a substantial medicine ball, which I came to learn was often employed after my supervisory session with her personal trainer. For me, this recollection seems so in keeping with the Marion Tolpin who taught me about 
the growing edge of development and the perspective element in the total transference. Now for a bit about the case that she supervised. Bob was a 35-year-old gay man who was very split about his homosexuality. He came to treatment after a traumatic breakup and explained to me that he had intense desires that led to his falling in love with men who did not love him back. As it turned out, his homosexuality bore a complex relationship to his struggles for masculinity. It provided him an opportunity to connect with an idealized masculine object, and at the same time, contributed to his doubts about his own masculinity. Early on, <clears throat> I was attentive to any material in the sessions that suggested the unfolding of a therapeutic alliance. Marion cautioned me that the theory of therapeutic alliance I wanted to employ may well obscure tendrils of health and the healthy development needed to be reactivated in depth. As she put it, there were theory-related blind spots that could hinder our recognition of the client's psychic reality. Importantly, these blind spots could eclipse the transferences that derive their force and impetus from the still viable, what she called, quote, tendrils of healthy childhood motivations, strivings, expectations, and hopes of getting what is needed now from the forward edge in relationship to the analyst. Her cautionary note to me was supplemented then by her referring me to read Stone's The Psychoanalytic Situation. And in particular, here does his description of the psychoanalytic vacuum, created by a far too exclusive emphasis on transference as childhood pathology. That void, she noted, was often filled in with concepts like alliance, real relationship, and new object, pushing out the important transference of health. Fundamentally, Marion taught me that analysis of the forward edge of the transference was at least as important as analyzing the revived trailing edge pathology. These distinct transferences were teased apart in the examination of the clinical material set before both of us. The following two examples uh, I'm going to provide. The first one, a vignette that happened in the 11th hour uh, when Bob reported his first dream. Bob said about his dream, I came back from business school, a summer internship. My roommate rented out two bedrooms. There were 35 people in each room. 70 altogether. People were sleeping everywhere. Beds were shoved together. Most of the people were Katrina victims. Some were Indians from India. One person was a client of mine from work. And then the dream was me taking a shower. The drain started to overflow. All the water went to one corner of the shower. I saw a toy truck in the shower spinning its wheels. It's one of those trucks run by remote control. That's all I remember. Bob associated to his recent Easter vacation and the joy he experienced with his nieces and nephews flying kites and playing with remote control toys. He thought the spinning wheels in his dream was a metaphor for his life. He said he felt that in spite of all his efforts, he was not getting anywhere. He thought the Katrina people were wrecks with no place to go, and he associated to his condo, which was presently under reconstruction. 
He said he wanted people to see what he had done with it and to admire his work. The project of renovation was also about himself, his own narcissistic strivings seeking creative expression. With this, he readily agreed. Marion pointed out that in the dream, one could see both the trailing and forward edges. Bob's wish for renovation was a tendril of his healthy grand self. This contrasted with the trailing edge of his damaged sense of himself, metaphorically represented by the Katrina people. Bob wanted to build something of himself, but he was not sure that he could. These two aspects of himself stood side by side. The self-doubt spoke to the tendrils of health, not yet fully activated in depth, not yet engaged in the vital working through process. In the second vignette, it took place almost a year later. Bob was imagining another Easter visit to his mother and his family. He was angry he could not bring his boyfriend and it raised the issue of his mother's objections to his homosexuality. Early trauma, particularly around his gender self, and the rigidity of his family and culture vis-a-vis -vis his developing homosexuality did not contribute to an expectable, empathic world consisting of what Marion called the three R's, recognition, respect, and reparation for this little boy who lived in the Midwest farming community. I asked what his thoughts were about his situation, wondering if he should have what he called a gay conversation with his mother. He fantasized the conversation. Mom, what's wrong with being gay? Why do you worry what people will think? I am normal. He paused, mulling it over. Then he continued with strain in his voice. Then I want to say to her something like, I don't ask you to accommodate to me. Why should I accommodate to you? I wonder what the purpose of this conversation would be. I responded, well, what do you think it's about? And he continued with pained intensity. Well, is it to persuade or to punish her? Do I want to say to her, you called me Mary? Or do I want to say to her, I was born this way, it's your fault? Or maybe I wasn't born this way. You called me Mary and made me this way. It's all about punishment. What do you think? I responded, well, I'm thinking about our last session when you said that what a turn on it was to teach Juan, your friend, a lesson during sex. And the other turn on you described when sex talk turned to saying, how do you like it when I punish you like this? Bob did not respond to my comments. In fact, he seemed to be let off track. Finally remarking after a little bit of time, that's interesting. Does it sound adolescent? The supervisory session addressing this interaction reminded me of Jewel Miller's report of cohort supervision of his case of a 30-year-old man. In that instance, Miller interpreted his patient's eagerness to relay important and interesting information to him as a manifestation of unconscious competition. Cohort, however, was of the opinion that although a competitive element was present, it was of secondary importance. Similarly, Marion pointed out that Bob had begun with a forward edge of self-affirmation, saying, I'm normal. She commented that in contrast to my response, she might have kept in mind this primary configuration of a forward edge. And she may have said, Bob, 
the purpose of your conversation is to sweat to persuade your mother and yourself but when you are in such such self doubt you anticipate being thwarted and what emerges is a grudge my own response had not followed bob's lead of i am normal uh, my response is thwarted the forward edge first by a neutral response like what do you think and then later by focusing on the trailing edge that came from conversation at the previous session in addition i had failed to go to the deepest level in this instance the maintenance of the cohesiveness of the self the central analytic issue marian pointed out to me is this he says he ought to say this is who i am and therefore it would be preferable to say i think you want to say this is who i am but it is not strong in you, in you enough to do it now the turn i had taken was in the direction of what marian called the intermediate sequences bob's punitive and sadistic comments were intended to protect his self-doubting and vulnerable self the intermediate sequence was a part of his response to an anticipated self-object failure marian felt that the interruption of the ongoing transference was the most important level to both pay attention to in that moment and to be addressed the deepest level of the psyche she explained to me consisted of the strivings of the forward edge fortunately bob would endeavor to shape me into the analyst who could understand him and about whom he could be proud he needed me to be positively influenced and affected by him which was often expressed by his periodically informing me of useful technology and its updates he hoped that his analysis would provide him with what he needed in order to resume his own developmental process in the direction of an expanded and consolidated self in spite of my stumblings he was still capable of trusting his analyst enough to reveal his injuries and anticipate that they would be acknowledged and healed in supervision with marian i came to understand the fragility that attended bob's sense of his masculinity and his use of symbolic and sexualized ways to cure himself and to succeed in the pursuit of a masculine identity these endeavors often degradation products were secondary to the central issue his wish for what he called quote the ultimate masculine experience unquote an affirmation of his own manhood the subject of inexact interpretations came up in the, this context of our work together marian connected this idea to the theory induced blind spots that she had first addressed to me in the context of that therapeutic alliance she would say blind spots restrict our clinical visions about our clients and our own psychic realities she encouraged me to practice teasing out the forward edge which she called priming it was important she said not to short circuit deep reanimations of the transference of health by a one-sided privileging of trailing edge developmental pathology i became acutely aware of theory blindness in my own work with bob and found it important to reappraise what contributed to the valid clinical data i ought not overlook for a long time bob driven by a need for restoration sought out behavioral enactments of sexual fantasies 
partaking of all the sensual sensory motor ways that are part of the longed for restoration of a self self object tie. Often when he traveled, I worried that his sexual enactments might result in some personal harm. Yet over time, through a long series of microscopic steps, his sense of a masculine self emerged. And in the process of integration, he experienced a restoration of his insufficiently established male self and experienced pride in both who he was and what he had achieved. He tended to feel, in these days, hopeful and happier. Returning from his quests for the ultimate masculine experience, he told me excitedly about the bathhouses he had visited, the South American beaches where the beautiful bronzed men strolled along the ocean line and colorful speedos, and where flirtatious tan men in white shirts glanced over their shoulders with inviting smiles at him. I came to see these images were compelling and appreciative symbols of masculine beauty and desire. These were powerful mirroring affirmations of male anatomy and sexuality that not to be obscured by any of my inexact interpretations. In conclusion, for me, what is lasting is Marion's view that at the depths of the human psyche were the strivings for the forward edge, a perspective that corresponded to her view that the natural state of the self was one of wholeness, cohesion, and integration. This perspective gave me an interpretive lens through which to both see and understand Bob, his ambitions and goals, including his sexual goals. His growing experience of himself as cohesive in both time and space, put together enough both with his past and moving forward, meant that he could form a meaningful relationship with a man who this time would love him back. As he and his boyfriend planned a joint household and planned having children, he described his experience in that moment in a metaphoric expression of getting aboard a shiny new train, which was for him a creative, productive future. Thank you. David, why don't you go ahead and begin? Do I need to click on anything? You're fine. Just talk away. Okay, well, uh, I just want to say thank you to Thetis. Um, it sounds like it was a very in-depth and productive analysis um, that you worked on with Marion. Uh, and I'm, I'm impressed about several of the ideas that she presents in this uh, set of reflections this evening. Um, let me just uh, jump in. Um, Dr. Tolpin supervised my last control case, Sandra, a 24-year-old artist who worked at the same medical school where I did. She suffered from a mixture of intense anxiety and depression. I saw her at a reduced fee in the medical school's clinic. At the same time, I saw my other patients in my private practice office in downtown Holland Park. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Sandra, uh, my control case. 
Um, at the age of three, Sandra's biological father left Sandra and her mom, and he moved to California and remarried another woman. About a year later, Sandra's mom remarried uh, herself. Uh, she married a guy who was a trainer at the Great Lakes Naval Base. Uh, her stepdad, this man, new man, Carl, he adored Sandra, would never think of leaving her. He always had a gleam in his eye for her. Each night when he came home from work at the base, he would pick up Sandra with a big hug and a squeal. Carl got several transfers to other Navy bases, so the three of them were frequently moving, and thus her friendships were not long lasting. When Carl was redeployed to the Great Lakes uh, training base uh, again later, Sandra went to Highland Park High School for her senior year where she excelled uh, stupendously academically. During that time, it was the first time she had sexual relations. The boy, Tom, was rough and almost violent. She found the connection to be intense and she had an orgasm, but he continued to be overly aggressive with her to the point where she eventually broke off the relationship. When Sandra finished high school and was a fine arts major uh, at a local college, she majored and graduated in sculpture, which is interesting. She made many girlfriends and took a job after, school, after uh, college um, at the same medical school where I worked as a residency training director. She had heard I was offering a reduced fee analysis and we started working together. I saw her in my uh, school office during lunch times and I saw Sandra also at the school's clinic reduced fee clinic. For four years, Marion supervised my analysis with Sandra uh, at the Tolpins house where she had an office. She, and there was uh, her husband's Paul's office. Um, Marion supervised my analysis with Sandra at her house or over the phone. A little bit about me and Marion. I knew Marion pretty well as she had encouraged me to go to the Institute and I started working with her husband, Paul, in analysis. Um, so I went into her a great deal. We wrote a paper together on a twinship environment between myself and one of my psychotic patients. In addition, I arranged for her to provide a group supervision for our residents on a monthly basis. We were both uh, fans of Henry Ellenberger's the discovery of the unconscious, and she and Paul had started working on a compilation, later a book, on Kohut's Institute lectures. What I didn't know was how fond she was of Eric Erickson, but I thought about him a lot uh, in ma making preparations for tonight's uh, readings. As I reflected on uh, the 1997 paper that uh, Dennis, Dr. Shelby uh, alluded to. I began to muse on her later 2002 paper on the psychoanalysis of normal development, which is a well-known paper, uh, and her concept of the forward edge. I started to treat the residents more about development, and I began to see a potential link between Erickson's uh, eight stages. There was trust versus mistrust, autonomy versus shame and self-doubt, intimacy versus isolation, all the way to his integrity versus despair. And I wondered in writing this small paper, could the forward edge correspond to the first concept that Eric Erickson would bring out? There was always a stage and a phase and a challenge. For example, is intimacy a forward edge? Would Marion's trailing edge correspond to, in that arena, Erickson's ideas about isolation? Is the forward edge uh, 
um, into intimacy um, as well. In this 1997 paper, Marion referenced the case of an adolescent boy who dreamed of being chased around a room by giant scissors. In the framework of ego psychology and Oedipal theory, the problem was framed as castr castration anxiety because of the scissors, instead of an adolescent's fears of having his autonomy cut off by an overwhelmingly intrusive mother. This 1997 paper had, I think to myself, and maybe to others would see it as a bridge between drive theory and self psychology. In supervision, Marion focused less on Sandra's developing an active sex life, but more on the tendrils of health that related to her gender identity and self esteem. Sandra had not had a safe sexual relationship before starting her analysis. Towards the end of treatment, she got involved with a woman someone who listened to and admired her, and Sandra eventually married this woman in spite of her family's ob objections. She was over time able to turn her mom and Carl around and accept her sexual preference and relationship. Clearly, Marion did not focus on drive theory constructs of sexual development and behavior. As indicated in the 1997 paper, a satisfying sexual experience occurs best in a relationship that echoes successful early self self object transferences. As I mentioned previously, Sandra had a stepfather who adored her and her marital relationship mirrored those experiences. Uh, so in this 1997 paper, Marion moves from drive theories hallucinated dual unity of the oral stage from anal tensions and phallic concerns uh, and other drive objects to self-object experiences of mirroring idealizing and twinship experiences. The 1997 paper also reminded me of the movie The Silence of the Lambs wherein the visual polymorphous needs of Buffalo Bill's voyeurism eventually led the young woman, uh, Detective Clarice, to the rooming house where Buffalo Bill, the villain, uh, could see and scope out, so to speak, his victims. Uh, empathy first and foremost. Marion could be tough as a supervisor. She called me out from time to time, sometimes in what I thought was a not empathic and or to jolt me back though, into an empathic posture, um, always remembering how to interpret data. At one point, the medical school's clinic was undergoing reconstruction and it was, it was kind of noisy. I was okay with it, but Sandra remained disturbed. She thought maybe she should stop treatment. I worried about losing a control case. My preference was to work it out in the clinic. But she remained upset by the noise of the reconstruction. She was quite familiar with Highland Park from high school and knew I had a private practice there. Marion said to me, well, hey, did you expect her to be seen on a construction site? <laughs> I took Marion's not so subtle hint and moved the treatment <laughs> to the office. Marion was an outstanding role model in terms of dealing with very painful states of mind. For example, I remember Sandra recounting a trip to Southern Illinois with her newfound girlfriends. When one of them, Judy, was shaming her mercilessly about her appearance. Judy was an old classmate of hers, not very successful. Marion's comment and advice to me was to tell Judy, Judy, you're the last person who should be casting stones. She was a wizard with meta metaphor <clears throat> and uh, knew how to mitigate shame and to reestablish for Sandra in coaching me uh, in supervision that resulted in much more vitality, inner power, and a sense of self-confidence. Um, Marion's view of psychopathology uh, relating to Freud's psychosexual stages 
centered around a vast vocabulary of what eventually would be labeled as an affect states such as loneliness, devitalization, deflation, isolation, or in its worst ways, collapse. All of these serve as trailing edge symptomatologies rather than mechanisms of defense. So as you wrap it all up, this 1997 paper should be known by a lot more people because it really establishes a bridge between drive theory and the emerging field of self-psychology. Thank you very much. Um, this is uh, Lucy Freund again, and um, I'm going to give a summary of the two papers that you've just heard, but I'm also hoping that everybody will be thinking about questions they might want to ask of David or Thetis about their work. So I'm going to talk first about Thetis's paper, and I just have a few comments to make. Um, I love the description of Marion ushering Thetis into her office with her expansive warmth and joyous spirit, channeling her eagerness to me about my control case known as Bob. That's the quote from, from um, Thetis's paper. I would change this to read Marion's eagerness to be with Thetis. I have a similar memory that occurred when Marion had broken her ankle and was, was unable to drive downtown. And as I had an appointment with her to present a case, Marion called and asked if I would like to see her in her home office in the suburbs. I dutifully wrote down the directions and as I finished, Marion said, now read them back to me. As I did so, I was moved to realize how much Marion wanted to be sure I got there and wanted to see me. I must mention too that when I actually got to the appointment, I mentioned how moving this had been to me, what Marion said, but, um, or what she said that about repeating the directions. And she looked at me and said, well, she said, Lucy, you didn't have a Jewish intrusive mother. So <laughs> she had zingers like she had with Thetis and, and David. Um, I think that whoever she took on, be it a patient, a supervisee, or a student or students, she was wholly and completely there and engaged. You were the special person for that time. Now I'm talking about Thetis's case. When Bob started his analysis, he explained he had intense desires that led to his falling in love with men who did not love him back. Using the material from Marion's paper, we are left to wonder about his early attachments. Um, uh, is he acting out an early scenario in which the longings for his adored mother were not acknowledged nor responded to in a loving manner? We certainly know that by the time he realizes he is attracted to boys, men, he was demeaned by his mother and as Thetis writes, early trauma, particularly around his gender self and the rigidity of his family and culture, vis-a-vis -vis his developing homosexuality did not contribute to an expectable empathic world consisting of recognition, respect, and reparation for a little boy's cohesion. However, since Bob is also very ambivalent about his homosexuality, perhaps the falling in love has other dimensions. From the forward edge perspective, Bob's desire to feel powerful and masculine propels him into a relationship where he can not only experience his own manhood, but also fuse with another admired man forming that a longed for twinship. As the analysis progressed, Bob's sense of masculinity and uh, as a masculine self emerged. As Thetis continues, in the process of integrating he experienced a, ma a restoration of his insufficiently established male self and pride in who he was and what he had achieved. He tended to feel hopeful and happier. Thetis, with her capacity to recognize Bob's nascent 
unmet needs allowed them to emerge and grow into a self that is whole, cohesive, and continuous over time. By the end of analysis, Bob had found and married Gustavo. That was in an earlier paper that Thetis wrote describing the various men, but it was the fellow that he ended up with. Um, he married Gustavo, a loving, generous man with whom he could climb aboard the shiny new train. So I'm going to, I hope you all sort of stuck with me through that. I'm gonna now talk about David's paper and then we're up for your questions. David's paper. There are many interesting ideas and observations in David's paper which provoke questions such as, what is Ellenberg's discovery of the unconscious? I actually looked that up on Pep Web and Ellenberg has a number of French and German papers, not many English, and I couldn't find anything about the unconscious, so I guess that's a book. So maybe David can tell us about it later. Um, also, could we focus more on the possible interconnection between Marion's idea of the forward edge and Erickson's stages of development? I thought that was a very interesting idea in uh, David's paper. Perhaps these and other questions can be discussed during the Q&A. However, I want to focus on what I see as the main point of David's empathic and caring analysis with Sandra. Sandra had been very lucky in having an adoring stepfather who delights in her and her accomplishments. Although David doesn't say much about the mother, we are left with the feeling that she too takes delight in her daughter and clearly has made a very good choice in picking this warm and joyful man to be her husband. After a very unsatisfying sexual relationship in high school, Sandra ultimately forms a sexual loving bond with a woman and in doing so repeats the relationship she had had with her stepfather. Or as Sandra says, someone who listened to and admired me. Marion's point is that the early attachments form a bedrock from which other relationships spring. Quoting Marion, our motives, ambitions, and goals, including sexual goals, are rooted in affectionate bonds. The nature of sexuality depends on the nature of these bonds. So how one experiences sexuality and all that it entails is ultimately bound up with our earliest attachments. Looking now at another part of David's paper, his relationship with Marion, he comments that she could be a tough supervisor. As an example, when David wanted to continue doing therapy while construction was going on in his medical building office, Marion jolts him with, did you expect her to be seen on a construction site? I think another way to look at this is that the patient's disturbance at the noise was her own tendril of health, fusing Marion's idea of the forward edge with perhaps those of ours. Thank you. Um, fusing Marion's idea of the forward edge with those of Erickson, the patient might be saying, my self-esteem, indeed my sense of self or identity, does not allow me to be treated so badly. Looking at the relationship between Marion and David, I see that they have formed their own twinship. As admiring David is of Marion, we assume the idealization goes both ways. As a well-known analyst would only write papers with a colleague she admires and cares about. I also see Sandra's growth in her treatment as a function of David's strength with a push from Marion. So it's open to everybody now and their questions and I think Dennis is gonna take over. Hello, back again. Uh, we have about seven. Here I am. We have about 75 people tonight, so we really can't open it up for verbal questions. But if you use the instant message feature, uh, I will relay your questions on to Lucy, Vetus, and David. And I'm gonna text everybody 
that so it'll pop up on your screen and you'll know where the instant messages is because it will tell you you have a message. <laughs> So do, do, was there, Lucy, was there anything you, to talk about while we're waiting? Well, I was wondering if David wanted to talk more either about the Ellenberg idea of the unconscious or about Erickson and Marion's ideas, the Erickson stages along with Marion's um, forward edge. But I also don't want to put you on the spot, David. I think he's muted. Let me find him. I'm looking for him to unmute him. I'm not used to managing 75 people. This is a, a challenge. A crowd. There you go, David. Right here. Well, that's generativity versus stagnation. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a wonderful question, Lucy. Did, did you get it, David? Which one? Re tell, repeat your question. Well, I, either uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about Ellenberg, who I didn't know of, and his ideas about the unconscious or um, the, what you suggested with Marion's forward edge uh, merging with Erickson's stages. Um, I was, uh, if, if I think if it was gonna be, well, first of all, Ellen Berger, I think is 1980, it's a book. It starts off with, uh, he traveled um, around the world and was um, keen on the idea of, of um, the unconscious. And he went from shamanism to um, spiritism. And depending on the era in which uh, he found these groups of people who uh, had a different focus that all had similar threads of the unconscious through them, spiritism, religion, um, that's Alan Berger. And uh, in terms of um, Erickson, you know, I was, uh, it seemed to me that the, the, the front edge of the challenge, mm -hmm. autonomy versus shame and self-doubt, you know, does it have a correlate with forward and trailing edge in some way mm -hmm. that hasn't been explored yet? So this was, it was nice for me to have uh, a venue in which to hear what other people might think about that. Um, and I, <clears throat> I would want, I want to thank Thetis for what I found to be a very, you know, there were some ideas in there, um, inexact interpretations. So uh, that's a question I have more than a response. Um, but if somebody wants to text to, to me, I'll try to uh, respond as quickly as possible. Um, should I say something? Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. So, um, thinking about, uh, you know, the inexact interpretation, but I want to say something about Erickson, too. Um, I think it fits in, in a way, with Erickson. Is, is that, uh, I think that sometimes when Marion was talking about inexact interpretation, she distinguished herself from Glover in his own paper on inexact and inaccurate interpretations. And I think she was talking about what was missing out of the fullness of the interpretation. Uh, potential, uh, particularly the forward edge. So, uh, you know, if you think about uh, Erickson, um, Erickson as critique of Freud's uh, Dora case uh, was that he did not think that Freud in his efforts to uh, underline his own, inter his own theory had given adequate space to Dora's experiences. 
including what could be seen as some of her uh, for own forward edge. Uh, so that's one of the ways in which I think about uh, how I experienced uh, Marion talking about inexact interpretation connected as she connected it in, in our work together with the uh, uh, the theor theoretical blindness. Theoretical blindness being by virtue of this theory, I can't take into consideration important data, uh, which ought to be part and parcel of our understanding. But the other thing that I think is similar, uh, contributes to Marion is that if we think about Erickson's psychosocial uh, developmental stages or psychosexual, there's the impact of the social experience. And uh, that I think fits in with Marion's you know, discussion of uh, of the importance of uh, self-object experiences in the whole developmental process. Anybody else have uh, questions? What are your thoughts? Whose thoughts, mine? Yes. Um, I focus on two elements in this paper. I guess the question is why does it, why hasn't it rolled off my syllabus in 20 years? Uh, why do I keep it as a required reading? Well, the, for two reasons. One, you know, you know, younger psychotherapy students and younger candidates, where is it written how we listen and talk to our patients about their sexual activity? Is it just a bunch of drives going back forth and getting discharged and everybody feels better? Or is there something else going on? So this idea that, that sexual acts re- visit, re-engage the depth of early self-object experiences and the history of those experiences mm -hmm. via the metaphor uh, that, that's played out in sexuality, I think is brilliant. And you can do so much with that. And the other element I think is so important is the idea of self-structure. That her phrase, uh, what is it? The grandiose stores needed to venture into the fray of dating, <laughs> something like that. Uh, venture into the fray, and it is a fray. And when you think about it, the self-structure needed to successfully venture into the fray is considerable. So I love it because it brings in two elements for students and candidates to think about the firmness of the self, as she often said, the self-structure needed to carry out a vital sexual life and ongoing relationships, and the idea of what is happening as, and what are we listening for as patients recount their sexual encounters. Um, and where, if we feel an interpretation would be helpful, what is it we're interpreting and why? So those are the two elements uh, that I think are very helpful. And it really helps you know, candidates and students listen to accounts of sexual activity in a very different way. Depathologizing. Depathologizing. I have to, we have to remember this was written in 1997 and psychoanalysis was very ambivalent about giving up, uh, as we call it, the gay thing. <laughs> they were very ambivalent in 1997. Um, and here she is putting out this very egalitarian perspective that it doesn't talk about straight, gay, and it, it talks about people. And the, the other element I think we should consider is I'm pretty sure this paper was her response to Goldberg's The Problem of Perversion. Mm -hmm. um, I know she and Paul did not like that book. They, um, and when Marion would get stuck on an idea, she stayed stuck on that idea. 
<laughs> but her thing was that it was a thinly veiled attempt to control the patient's behavior. Mm -hmm. So we see on one hand, I think there's a lot to offer in the Goldberg book. Uh, but then we hear, you know, Marion say, but enough of us talking about sexual pathology. Let's talk about sexual normalcy. Um, if you think about it, how many analytic papers are there on sexual normalcy? <laughs> there are few. <laughs> so those are just my thoughts about it. There, there is a question um, from uh, Jennifer Rabinowitz. How do you think about the forward edge? Is it conscious? That's a good question. Yeah. And its strivings, I think, is one good place where you'll see it. And his strivings as conscious, you mean? No, actually. He's unconscious. Right. Not all the time, but. Right. Yeah, I think it could be both. I often think in terms of what is the patient or, or person trying to accomplish. And often that what you come up with then is, is a forward edge kind of thought or feeling. Yes. And sometimes and I, that can be either conscious or unconscious. Right. And I, I think there's the transference element too. Because, and I, one of my readings of her paper on the forward edge or total transference, I think she changed it to total transference before she yeah. had to retire, uh, picking up on Racker. But that to, for the transference to fully engage the forward edge is what I think she was looking for. And to let, a trans, let the transference participate in those strivings becoming manifest. Because mm -hmm. I, I was looking through to see if there's anybody else here that was in the seminar she taught on the forward edge. I don't recognize my classmates. But it was, you know, she would talk about, she was very interested in childhood fantasies, uh, favorite fairy tales, favorite books. Um, if the, you know, the favorite TV shows, the favorite things that kids would look at and often kind of <clears throat> get in there and start thinking about what was the child trying to experience? What were they trying, what were they striving for? Um, so I, I, I think there's probably a man conscious manifestation of the forward edge, but the strivings are often deep in the, in the depths. There's another question. How was her paper received in 1997? Thank you. Um, how, how many people have, have read this paper before tonight? How many people knew it was there? I didn't know. I didn't know it was there. I didn't yeah. know until we started this, this uh, society meeting. <sighs> Well, depending on your, your perspective, you'd blame it on, on the annual, which I don't think is fair. It's published in the annual. <laughs> but I think my, my theory is it didn't take off because psychoanalysis was not ready for thinking about normal sexuality. Um, you know, that you know what? We're all about sexual pathology, aren't we? I think there's that element as well as the deep ambivalence mm -hmm. that I mentioned earlier. I, I think it, so. My answer is well, not very many people noticed it in 1997, so we were revising it. Jim, you were editor at that point, weren't you? 
No. Okay. From Molly Witten. I remember Marion suggesting that the forward edge often manifested as an unconscious striving and a conscious enactment whose meaning is often misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Molly. How's that for a good one, response? Good. It's, a, it's in your uh, group chat if you want to read it. I think it's well said. Very well. An unconscious striving and a conscious enactment whose meaning is often misunderstood. Well, that's mm -hmm. lovely. Thank you, Molly. How did it come to be suggested as a reading theme setting for this evening? Um, I had made a push for uh, increasing our papers and speakers focusing on gender, sexuality, and orientation. Um, and this paper fit the bill. And so that in part because um, I think there's so much profound material in this paper. To try and summarize this paper was an, a, a job for both Fetus and David. Um, but I think it was just, uh, you know, that's mainly what I, I brought it up and pushed for us to do it. But I think it's a classic paper that deserves more attention. And so we brought it up. I think there's a way, can, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a, a, what real, another thing that really came strongly to me and going over her paper a couple of times was how it really served as a bridge between drive theory and, and the beginnings of self psychology. Maybe not the very beginnings, but really constructing a bridge or, or that this paper served as a bridge between the two theories. Um, and it, it was, it was a, a tough paper to read and, and uh, sort of get an idea of where it stands in the way people were thinking and reading at that time. Well, this is about the time we would move to our reception. <laughs> so if people want to crack out their uh, their wine, their Prosecco, their whatevers and stay around and chat, we'll pretend we're having, we'll have our, what, virtual reception and hang out and loosen up and ask good questions <laughs> and uh, continue the discussion for anybody that wants to stay and talk. You know, as, as a wrap up, I do want to say that we are not quite sure the status of our programming in September, whether we'll be online again or whether it'll be live. A lot of it hap has to happen, you know, depend is dependent on the virus and what's happening with that. Um, but given the amount of people that showed up tonight, this looks like a kind of popular way to do it. So uh, we won't hesitate to uh, move to Zoom if we still have restrictions on crowds and the especially over 60 um, part of it. Uh, but we'll just watch it and see. We have a beautiful programming laid out for next year. It'll be in the newsletter shortly. Um, for the, but just watch for the newsletter and we'll be deciding you know, very soon if we're going to be live again or if we're going to stay on Zoom until things have settled down with the virus. Sounds like a good idea. Very good idea. Um, I'm going to unmute Jim because he just sent me a three paragraph 
instant oh. message that was quite lovely. <laughs> and I can't read it. I can't read it as, as pretty as Jim can say it. So I'm going to tell him. I'm going to turn it over to him. There you oh. go. Well, thank you. Can you hear me, please? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Please. Okay. Yes, I just wanted to emphasize how valuable it is for us to celebrate Mary and Tulpen. I'm just delighted that we had this program today. Uh, for those of us who knew her and were influenced by her, uh, we benefit from being reminded of what she stood for. And for those of us who never met her, tonight gives us an opportunity to learn why she was so special. Uh, I hadn't read this paper before. Um, I became the uh, associate editor of the annual psychoanalysis a year or two after it was published uh, and hadn't read it. Um, uh, and I, I think that this paper expresses her most important point. And all of the speakers alluded to that in one way or another, and I just wanted to underline it. Uh, psychoanalysis uh, in the period up to uh, uh, Winnicott and Kohut and certain other uh, 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 thinkers who really changed our point of view was obsessed with a pathological view of sexuality. And I think it has a lot to do with Freud's own personal experience. I won't go into that. And uh, I have a passage from her paper that I quoted. And I, of course, you can also see it written out because I sent it to everybody uh, that captures the difference between her and Freud that Freud saw, felt that so much of childhood experience was like really questionable and problematical because it pointed to the Oedipus complex, that there was so much that was pathological in what was going on with a child. For example, a child being curious about one's parent or perhaps a boy uh, child wanting to be touched by his mother. All of that was very suspect to Freud. Uh, and here's this, uh, paragraph or the, these couple sentences that Marion wrote. She wrote, uh, the importance of looking and being looked at for the developing self and its sexuality cannot be exaggerated. Children wanting to look at their parents and look up to them, wanting to be looked at by them, touching and caressing them and being touched and caressed by them, listening with rapt attention and being listened to, Smelling them and being smelled are among the ways a vigorous, cohesive self is constituted, maintained, and restored. Um, in other words, these behaviors, like being wanting to be looked at or touched, looking at your parents or being touched, touched by them, were pathological to Freud. But, and he interpreted them as they're suggesting something was wrong. And by analogy, he also looked at a lot of adult sexuality in a very suspect way. And Marion argued, in part, of course, uh, influenced by Kohut, that how important it was to develop a healthy attachment to parents. And that that comes about, in part, because of just these behaviors that Freud was so uncomfortable with and which he pathologized, that the foundation of health comes from this healthy attachment. And we could add to that that the foundation of healthy relationships later on in life often had a lot, often had a lot to do with um, the uh, with uh, the kinds of uh, interactions and behaviors that are associated with sexuality and intimacy. So that's my point. Lovely. Very good. Uh, Molly also sent me three paragraphs that I'm going to uh, ask her to chime in <laughs> and say what she had written because she can say it prettier than I can. <laughs> so I remember Marianne talking to us in class about an anecdote of a woman patient in her practice who dyed her hair outrageous colors one day after another, it mm -hmm. seemed, and put off everyone around her. This was in an era before there were leopard striped hair and purple and green hair. What Marion and her patient realized through her associations was that she tried, the patient was trying to expand her sense of self beyond what anyone thought characteristic of her. She felt energized by her analysis with Marion, um, but she didn't know consciously why she wanted to make everyone uncomfortable. And it seemed to come out that if people could accept her outrageous hair color, they would be relieved by the tameness of her wanting to expand 
the acceptance of herself in ways others have not considered as part of her. And it, Marion emphasized in, in her telling of it that it was because Marion's acceptance, radical acceptance of this woman's sense of self that the woman felt an expanded experience of herself that um, didn't come off as comfortable for anyone consciously, but <laughs> uncomfortable, unco I'm sorry, unconsciously really allowed her to get them ready for bursting out of her inhibition, her inhibited self. Mm. Was that during some, one of the classes that she was giving? Yeah, it was, it was in um, a class she taught us the semester or the term that Paul died. Because, you know, David, you stimulated me a memory of that. Paul died while she was teaching us. And we thought, well, she's not going to come back at all. And one by one, we each sent her... Um, a, co a condolence card, all very personal. We didn't know we were doing it. And two weeks later, she was back teaching us. <laughs> and we said, Marian, uh, how can you be doing that? And she said, listen, you all took me into your heart. And I felt like the least I could do is come back and teach you what I could. And it, it was remarkable to me two weeks after Paul died. So yes, David, it was during the class. That echoes sort of the point I was trying to make that when she took something on, you know, a person, a patient, a supervisee, student, she was totally 100% there with you. Yeah. Absolutely. She also said, interestingly enough, that she wasn't going to come back until we had all written to her, which is a good thing we did it in two weeks. Um, because she didn't want to make anybody uncomfortable with the newness of Paul's departure. Mm. So empathic to the students in our class. Thank you, Dennis. You bet. You know, Thetis, your, your memory of the ficus tree got me yeah. musing. <clears throat> that that tree was so happy in that office that if it, if it didn't get a vigorous pruning, as Marion called it, it would have taken over the whole place. <laughs> well, one day I walked in just as she walked in and somebody had vigorously pruned it. That's the only time I ever saw Marion beside herself yeah. was over her tree being pruned too much. Oh. But a year later, you couldn't have is bigger in the house again and taking over the office. Yes, it was so, right. It must have been the the milieu and <clears throat> the self object yeah. milieu that was. Yes, I all the warm so. sounds too. <laughs> it was. <laughs> yes. I think. Uh, did Maria want to add something? Maria. Maria. Coming, Maria. I'm unmuting you. Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> I I joined a bit late and. Um, but I, I decided I really wanted to respond to what Jim Anderson, um, his comments about and, and the excerpt he read from my mom's paper, which reminded me so much of infant development and um, infant development research that she adored and was yeah. very influenced by and how of course, infants want to, and children want to touch and smell and look at their parents, of course, right? That's, that's what infants and children do. And that would be my mother being very 
um, grounded in reality. <laughs> so that's my comment. I think uh, many of we are all a little envious that you were infant developed by her. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. You would, everyone would have liked to have had her as their mother, but you know, <laughs> having her, having her as a, having having her as your supervisor was a very good experience too. Yeah, so you got that. her too very much. Jim, do you have any things to say about being? Infant developed by Marion and Paul. <laughs> we have a new word. We've just invented a new word. New new psychoanalytic concept. Infant developed. But before my brother uh, replies or doesn't reply, we're we're I'm speaking not as her daughter, but as her as a person who as an adult, let's say, learn from her, with her. I mean, and read Daniel Stern. I mean, if you read Daniel Stern, if you are not a psychoanalyst, I don't, maybe he, was he part, he was psychoanalytically oriented, I don't remember. Um, he, yes? He, um, he became psychoanalyst. First, it was the mother-infant relationship research out of Boston. Yeah. And then they expanded that group more into psychoanalysis. Okay, okay. But that greatly influenced and probably uh, other things predated that kind of influence on her. You know, she, she was an observer of reality, right? So she liked to understand how children and parents interact. She was not wed to um, Freudian theory um, as some people were, and that's why she was drawn to Kohai. Hmm. Right, Jim? Where's Jim, my brother? Go ahead, Jim. You were talking to us earlier. Where's Jim Tulpin? I was going to say he's up in the upper right-hand corner, but he may not be on your screen. Um, oh, there he is. Is he going to, he's got his phone. Well, he's, let me see if I can. I, he's not muted by me. Okay. Um, let, I'll tell him he's got to unmute himself. Uh, Here he goes. He's calling yeah. in. Here he, he's coming. He's gone. Jim, for some reason, <laughs> it's trying to connect you. You're trying. When you learn to read this program, it gets pretty cool when, when you can feel the things it's trying to do. It's trying to connect you, and it's not doing a good job for some reason. I'm not sure why. In, in the meantime, Shelly, you, you hit me up privately. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Go ahead. Ah, oh, perfect. It's okay. so um, I I remember when that the paper first came out, and it was I think fairly well received by about maybe sixty percent of the self psychologists. There were people who were very classical or Goldbergian. Uh, and uh, they didn't like it, but most, most did, and it was a, a real advancement. In terms of the rest of analysis, uh, it was very disliked, uh, you know, because it was doing away with Freud and sexuality, 
uh, in a sense. And so that, that's how it responded. And I remember it was just a lot at the time. Uh, especially the self psychology. Uh, and the other thing is, I think people have talked about, which is Mary's capacity for empathy was incredible. Uh, I think she had more than both. Psychologists back then, until they really had enough treatment, uh, were more intellectually empathic, uh, and uh, so inherently developmentally like Mary and Mary. So it, it it was wonderful working with her and knowing her. Mm -hmm. Jim, we got you. We got you hooked up now. Here we go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Well, it was great to hear the recollections of my mother. Uh, they all rang true. And for me, she was quite the force of nature. She was really indefatigable. She was interested seemingly in everything and uh, always had everything planned out. When I'd come home, we'd have to take a rest and she had uh, many years older would be nonstop. Same as when she was in um, hospice. I was there with her for a couple of weeks and she'd be seeing a patient or two. And I'd say, mom, you got to give it a rest. This is about you getting better. And she'd nod, of course, and ignore me. <laughs> but that was how she was, just really indefatigable. And then she came home for three months uh, before dying and she worked on a paper with Lynn, I think. Lynn, who's on the, the call here. And uh, she was uh, pretty, pretty amazing. Thanks again. Thank I'm going to look for Lynn and see if she would like to add something. I'm looking for her. I think she's I'm gone. Not... Oh, you think she left? I, I don't see her anymore. Oh. Up. Yeah. These are wonderful questions. I mean, it's. I'd like to share an experience, if I can, that uh, Marion was a matchmaker of sorts, too. Um, my husband was going to give a talk in Belgrade. And she said to me, if you're going to Belgrade, you have to meet. And his first name was Alexandra, Alexander. And Jim Anderson, I'm sure, knows his last name. Um, which was a Serbian name. But anyway, she emailed him and said I was coming and that I would give him a call or a text. So when we got to Belgrade, I contacted him and we spent, originally it was scheduled for a 15 minute coffee break, which extended into five hours. Uh, <laughs> and I talked a great deal. He was translating <laughs> the analysis of the self into Serbian. And we talked a lot about Kohat, about having a practice. He hadn't started a practice yet. And then we were joined by my husband for dinner. And then the discussion, his parents were actors and musicians. And then the discussion get, became very rich into all kinds of literature and music and art. And it was just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And then he and I, late, years later, met this fellow Alexander in New York at the one of the psychoanalytic meetings and had a wonderful lunch. But he was just a, a delightful man, but it was all Marion's doing. And she did it actually while I was at her house. She walked into the other room and said, I'm going to send him right now. And she did. And it was just wonderful. And I'm sure there were other things like that that she did for other people too. Unbelievably generous. That's great. Yeah. I thought Shelley made this wonderful point about the difference between intellectual empathy and, you know, emotional empathy that goes for the depths and brings it forward. I think that was an important distinction. One you probably have to be 75, 80 to be able to do correctly. But oh, well. Something to strive for. Jim, you had your hand up? Oh, he's got the name. 
Oh, good. yeah. Well, yeah, uh, his name was Alexander Dmitrievich, and he's Serbian, but is a professor at the, uh, the uh, International Psychoanalytic University in Berlin. It's amazing to me, there's a psychoanalytic university with 600 students. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, but why, why was it that Marion knew him and put him in touch with Lucy? Well, because he was in Chicago at some point as, as a young man with a budding interest in psychoanalysis and came over to the Institute and Marion and the Jerry Kafka, who was the librarian of the Institute and an analyst, uh, took, him under, took him under their wing and assisted him and helped get him involved and made things, uh, gave him a chance to have a connection to our Institute and fostered his interest in psychoanalysis. So even at that earlier point, before it was a bigger thing that she did, so to speak, than putting you and Alexander in touch, that she was very instrumental in this man who's now a professor at the Psychoanalytic University, uh, getting involved in this way in psychoanalysis in the first place. And Alexander repaid his, as I recall, his debt to some extent by translating Kohut's books mm -hmm. into Serbian, Serbo-Croatian. Wow. wow. Mm -hmm. quite a I'll continue for a few more minutes just with one other match that uh, she made for me. She knew I was working on a paper by, about a book called The Reader, written by a German man. Um, and Martin Gossman, who is German and German analyst, uh, Marion knew him very well in his work. And again, she put me in touch with him at one of the self-psychology meetings. And Martin and I spent many times uh, talking about the book. He helped. I wrote a paper. He went over it and was very, very helpful. But again, I guess um, I, I had even forgotten about that, but just the sense of her giving so much of herself and what she knew to all of us. Yes. That's true. Now you could refill your wine. I see no one sitting with wine glasses and all right, we got, there we go. Show us your glass. Very good. Mine stainless steel. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, the, it's, you know, the, this is also a wonderful exposition about how Institute life is really determined by a few people and what can get going in an institute. I'm working on, and it's really a paper based on an experience I had with Marion and in a case conference where um, my, the, my, up, my theme is that you never know where the correct interpretation is going to come from if you're at an analytic institute because you're presenting in case conferences, you're presenting to your supervisor, you're, you're talking about the case with your analysts most often. And there's this thing that went on uh, where Marion basically said, oh, you silly boys, this is what's going on. Now stop it. <laughs> and <laughs> Patient had a dream the following week, and <laughs> was right. But the, you know, she saw all the guys kind of whirling around and twirling around, and what's this about? And what's this? Oh my God! Oh my God! And here's the voice of Marion going, "Oh, you silly boys, knock it off. Listen for this piece," and it worked. Well, I think Marion, Marion's idea of what was at the depth was very much different from what Freud thought was at the depth. Yes. Mm -hmm. She talks about wholeness and integration uh, as being uh, in the depth. I guess Cole had alluded to it too. Uh, well, that was very much different than uh, Freud, who at the, the depths of everything was conflict. Uh, irresolvable conflict in some ways. 
quite a bit different. Yep. Shelly, hold on, Shelly. What'd you have to say? Uh, I think one of the main contributions that she has made to self psychology is actually the book she wrote with Paul on the cohort lectures. Mm -hmm. I think it really captures. Uh, I think it's one of the more significant books that was written uh, because she really brought Kohut alive in a way where people could feel how he really was uh, who never knew him. And uh, I, I always tell people that that's what they need to read to students, candidates. Uh, and it's, it's the, I think the, other than, you know, mainly Kohut, uh, it's one of the best books that really helps self psychology. Yeah, I was, I'll second that. I picked the, that book has been on my shelf for, since it came out, and then I got asked to teach a course on it. So I cracked it for the first time in 10 or 15 years, and it was amazing. Right. Page after page after page, and she and Paul really focused it because you, you could tell he wasn't that precise sometimes. But boy, if you want an education in self psychology, it made it alive mm -hmm. uh, rather than just purely intellectual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It both. So the generativity continues. Right. There was one word that Paul used when I was in analysis with him that I'm still not sure exactly what it means, but it, he would, uh, they had, there was this study where he saw me, you know, it's just completely filled with books after book, after book, after book, after book. And there was one time where I was coming in for um, analysis and I, I would browse through his bookshelves, uh, Marion and his, um, and he would sort of come over to me and look over, you know, what you're reading. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I can't remember what he was, uh, it might have been how, how to use words, um, uh, but he said, um, I, I said, you know, I'm very interested in, you know, what you got going there. There's so much. And he says, well, we live in propinquity. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, saying to myself, what is propinquity? And then, so I finally got up enough herb to, nerve to ask him. And he said, it's like being close together. Um, like but, proximity? Pro, pardon? Like proximity? Well, there, I, I never found out, but I, I think it was the, the whole person. <laughs> so. As we don't live in propinquity right now because we're in isolation. That's yeah. we have to. That's <laughs> propinquity right. is against the law right now. <laughs> <laughs> What, what, do, what do people think uh, about the isolation creating either anxiety or depression? Anybody have any thoughts about that? Um, I didn't hear the last part. What, what was the last part? Of what do you think is helping or happening self-psychologically of uh, this whole COVID virus thing and the isolation and the people who were denying the isolation. Yeah. yeah. Anybody have any thoughts about that? It has put us much more in propinquity. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We, we, we have an as if propinquity. But when's the last time we had 80 people attend a society meeting like we have tonight? <laughs> it's the wish for propinquity. <laughs> Is that all right? 
Yeah. What I'm experiencing now, and I think I thank David for it, is a sense of propinquity with everybody here. Mm -hmm. Right. As yeah. part of the isolation. I mean, it really feels like I'm back to a normal kind of state. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Molly? So I, um, I looked it up and propinquity, an alternative, a, a thesaurus alternative is relationship. I think at the time that Paul said we live in propinquity, relationship was a dirty word in psychoanalysis. And now it's not such a dirty word that we understand that the relationship is the container of who we are. And so that's what Paul, I think, was expressing. Well, it's a, it's a self-object function, propinquity. Yes. <laughs> Good. Well, my, my joke about all of this is that I really enjoy faculty meetings. Because <laughs> I get to see everybody and we get to talk. <laughs> I think that says a lot if I'm enjoying a, fa uh, a faculty meeting. So are, are there 75 people out there? I mean, uh, we're down to 35, but we were up to 80. Really? Mm -hmm. um, Good to know. Yeah, hold on. Let me find Maria. Uh, here you go. Wave at me. You're coming. Hello. 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 I don't know if the um, Alexander, our Alexander, is still on the the call. Um, and they didn't say what pronouns they use. Um, but um, so the they talked about um being a queer activist a trans guy and a queer activist with a bit of analytic education and thinking about how the analytic world is more welcoming today than it has been in the past um and i think i mean i i would love to hear what my mother i, I don't you know i i would love to hear what my mother has to say about um anything but you know i i know that she as my brother mentioned she had lots and lots and lots of interests and influences and was very aware of different worlds and movements so that she because she believed in humanity and people becoming more fully human so if if our Alexander is still on the call, that I'm replying to you. They they said they'd like to hear more from me. So that's my my comment. He's on the call. Oh yeah. Is he where is he? I don't I I looked, but I couldn't find him. Would you, okay. Would you like yeah. to respond to Maria? Sure. Uh thanks. Um there you are. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. yeah, I look, um, that seems, uh, I am excited by your report. Uh, <laughs> good, good. Uh, yeah. And I look forward to telling other people um, uh, about this experience. So mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, and um, yeah, I wish I could have uh, met your mother. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a special treasure. Mm -hmm. she, she was. She was a very special person for many people. For many people, and that was her expansiveness. She and and it fulfilled a lot of needs for her. Her in her own self self psychology personal constellation. She had a lot of needs also, uh -huh. and you all kind of, and, and her work, both, you know, being an analyst and a teacher and 
it fulfilled a, a strong need for her too. That's my, that's my um, inside perspective, but I, I don't think that's anything um, groundbreaking. I think you'd all probably know that too. And uh, of all the, you know, as I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lapsed therapist. I'm, I have a, a master's in social work, but I'm not practicing and haven't been for the last, oh, more than a decade. But, you know, we all have, we all get, you know, some of the mutuality in a therapeutic relationship, or there is a real relationship because it, we're important to each other, right? Mm. <laughs> and and people were very important to my mother. You all were very important to my mother. <laughs> I'm beginning to think we should have our society meetings like this more often. <laughs> Any last thoughts? Technically, we have about 10, 15 more minutes, but if people are talked out, we're talked out. Well, thank you, Dennis, for introducing all of us to the paper. And, uh, and since you're adept at handling the technology, that was my greatest anxiety. <laughs> we figured it out. We figured it out. No, I want to. I want to thank David and Thetis and Lucy. Um, I first hit them up about this idea. What in December, January? You know, and originally we were going to have it in March, but then COVID came and we had two speakers that refused to do it on Zoom. They only wanted to speak live. So I said, well, fine. We cannot end the year silent. Let's put this on, uh, you know, either as a webinar or online with Zoom. And we did. And I think people look like they had a good time. Did you have a good time? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the, right. the <laughs> that's the trickiness of it. Uh, if I told Todd Essig, this really felt good. This, this meeting online really felt good. He'd go, aha, you're being tricked. Like, no, it really felt good, Todd. It's, it's okay. It felt good. So watch our newsletter. Um, we will be back in September, either online or in person, and continue as we've done since 1931. I do, we don't have an archivist or a historian, but I was, before we got on, I was wondering, has society ever canceled a lecture series because of an epidemic or a pandemic <laughs> or a war? I, I, or depression. Or depression. I mean, all those little, those annoying things in life. Um, probably not. I mean, you know. Well, I was kind of like, it. yeah, go ahead. I was no, thinking of Melanie Klein and analyzing. And the bombs. <laughs> yeah. Is that really true? It is true. Okay. What, Jim, is that true? You're, you're, you seem to know everything about everybody. Is what? Well, was Melanie Klein really working as the bombs were falling on London? Yes. <laughs> oh, I've read some about that. Uh, that uh, it, yeah, I don't know. Winnicott's sense of humor was one time the Blitz was going on and they were having a meeting and everybody was studiously avoiding it and trying to go on and pretend it wasn't happening. He raised his right. hand and stood up and said, I'd like to remind everybody that we're being bombed at the moment. Right, right. <laughs> It so apparently, took somebody that had, had a sense of the environment to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly hope to see you all back in September, you know, live or on Zoom. We will push ahead. And 
be sure to tell your friends that this was a nice experience if they're a little bit doubtful about whether this can happen and feel good for everybody. So again, I guess this means our season's over. Our lectures are complete for this year and we'll see you all in September. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on and thank bye you bye. for organizing. You bet. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. It was wonderful. In front of your tapestry, I do this. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was meant for. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.